Welcome to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion section session. Uh, my name is Dr. Kristen Fontes. My pronouns are she, her, and I will be your moderator for tonight's session. Um, tonight's program will be uploaded to the AAM JEDI website within 24 hours or by Monday at the latest. Um, these sessions are meant to be interactive, so please feel free um, to use the chat, raise your hand if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to offer up. Um, please know that this is a safe space as well. We welcome and encourage everyone's participation, and we always hope to foster respectful and open dialogue. Um, so we will now have our panelists introduce themselves. Our topic tonight is job searching for senior residents, designing your future. And I would like, so when I call your name, um, I'll have each panel just go ahead and unmute yourself and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, we'll start with um, Dr. Alvarez. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ellie Alvarez. I'm the Director of Wellbeing here at Stanford Emergency Medicine. Um, I sit in the uh, um, admissions uh, uh, discussions for uh, Stanford and also hiring in the residency and faculty uh, in our department. So I have uh, several experiences in that. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Brown. Hello, everybody. My name is Cortland, and I am a relatively junior faculty here at Carolinas in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm our department's vice director for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'm also our healthcare disparities and emergency medicine clerkship director. And then I am the AAEM JEDI section chair elect, and I'm very happy to be here. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Chopra. Hello, um, I am a practicing physician in San Antonio with Greater San Antonio Emergency Physicians, and I serve as the chief operating officer and vice president for our physician group. And uh, part of my duties uh, includes recruiting and um, I've been in practice for around 16 years. Excellent, welcome. Um, Dr. Mannix. Hi everyone, I'm Lexi Mannix. I'm the Assistant Residency Director and Clerkship Director at UF Jacksonville in Florida. Um, I'm about four years out from training, but have been heavily involved in mostly our recruitment from a residency perspective, um, but then also have experience as to relatively recently applying for a job. So I'm excited to chat with everybody today. Thank you so much. And finally, Dr. Mall. Hey everybody, I'm Joel Mall. I'm a professor and vice chair of education at Virginia Commonwealth University. I uh, had a lot of jobs before that, so I don't know if that qualifies me to be on here, but uh, several other academic institutions spent about eight years in the community, and I am not going to disclose how many years in the process I've been. Excellent. Thank you so much all for being here. Um, so tonight's topic is job searching for senior residents. Now, um, each of our panelists was asked to submit a couple of questions that they would like to cover during this session. So I will be using those to moderate the majority of our discussion. Um, I would also love to incorporate any questions um, from our audience. Uh, so please feel free to use the chat box for that or raise your hand and, and we can have you talk directly to our panelists. Um, let's start uh, the discussion here by just putting ourselves in the position of a senior emergency medicine resident um, who's just starting to look for jobs. Um, I'll start with a question submitted by Dr. Alvarez and invite any of our other panelists to uh, answer as well. And that goes for every question that we um, that we talk about during this hour. Um, so Dr. Alvarez, what uh, kind of thinking back to when you were looking for jobs, what is something that you wish you knew when applying for jobs? So I think that oftentimes uh, a lot of the focus is I just need to get a job. I need to be able to work in that place. How much salary uh, am I going to make? Um, over the years, what I've come to learn, uh, especially in my role now as director of well-being, I try to answer when I onboard people uh, things that they may have thought about or may not have considered um, as, as they onboard with us. So questions like what 
is support system look like um, in, in the, the place that you're applying for? Uh, because again, oftentimes uh, in residency, you, you're you surrounded by people that you know is there to take care of you when, when you're feeling down. Uh, when you're an attending, like you kind of want that same support system, um, not just to uh, help you when you're probably navigating some challenges, but also just to celebrate things. So I think understanding the existence of that support system is very helpful. Um, and also, I wish I knew, um, I work in an academic place, I wish I knew uh, some clarity about responsibilities beyond the clinical shifts. Like, I may know that I'm going to be working 12 shifts a month or 15 or however X number of shifts a month. But I also want to know, like, what are other expectations of me? And how do people work towards uh, getting promotion? I know probably you're not thinking about that at this stage, but I can guarantee you in two, three years, you're going to start wondering like, okay, like how do I move past this being a new attending uh, uh, status? So I think those are a few things that I can uh, think of. I'm sure several of the uh, speakers here will also be able to uh, apply. Yeah, you really offered up like a ton of great ideas. Like I'm just thinking back even to my own experience and how much, I guess maybe easier and, and probably more successful I would have been in, in finding a job if I had I thought about, um, you know, everything, like you said, outside of clinical shifts, like what's expected of me? Um, do I really need to be prioritizing things like, you know, salary and shift load or really there are other things like you said, support, I mean, Certainly, I think all of us in the last couple of years have really come to know just how much that means in your workplace. Um, so thank you so much for that. Yeah, I would I'll just add a little that. bit also. Oh, go ahead. I think one thing that I would think about, especially in academics, but I think it's pertinent in the community also, is really having a sense of why you were offered the job. So why does this place want you? You know, do they want you just because they need somebody to do shifts? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, if that's what you want, that's perfectly fine. And then that seems like a great fit. But do they want you because they need um, somebody to work on community aspect service of their residency? You know, I was hired because largely because I'm, you know, DEI focused and that's my passion. And so make sure that the reason why you want to join and what you want to do with your career perfectly aligns with why you're hired. Because um, if it doesn't, then that's where you're going to get into problems in the future. Yeah, what I was going to add too is I think it's really important to consider that you're coming kind of from, from lack of a better term, or a little bit of a bias situation in the sense that you've been in the same program for three or four years for residency, and you have some things that you love about it, you have some things that you may hate about it, and it's very easy to focus on like what you know in that environment and not ask questions that are going to be really important. You know, for example, you know, if you're holding a bunch of psych patients, and that really is the thing that makes you upset or frustrated or whatever, maybe you're going to overly focus on that when you look for another job and forget about the fact that, you know, hey, all the medicine patients and the ICU patients are, are sitting in your ED for a long time too, or, or what kind of pressures and things like that you get. So just try to have a little bit of a balanced approach and kind of, you know, not let any kind of, you know, pauses or negatives about your current situation overly derail when you're asking questions and assessing where you're going. I'll chime in one more time. Sorry, I like to talk a lot. Um, and I think this adds on to what Dr. Alvarez was saying, you know, make sure that the place that you're looking for is supportive. Um, and so things that you want to know, you know, if you're planning a family, what does that support explicitly look like? So what are the FMLA policies? What does the hospital do? What does the department do in addition to those? Um, just those things that are very specific and unique to your circumstance be very comfortable asking about them because if you're not at a place that supports what you want to do with your personal and professional life, it's not going to work out. Well. Yeah, LA, go ahead. I think also it's important to understand that oftentimes we limit ourselves when we're interviewing uh, to asking those questions just with the interview panel. So essentially like the leadership. Um, I wish I knew that. Uh, um, I can ask for, hey, can you give me a tour of the emergency department? And then just getting those names of the people that I've met there and then reach out to them independently so that I can get more of these unbiased uh, perspective that uh, oftentimes, again, they are courting you just as much as you do want to impress them. But the people who are working, especially the people who are working on shift, like 
I have learned a ton uh, when I sat down like during the interview and, and I just sat down in the in the emergency department to to watch how people interact. So then I can ask those like semi unfiltered questions. That's such a great point. I think I, I can recall I, I've I've had a lot of jobs too in my um, relatively short career so far. And I think most of the time it was uh, either like a, a sort of meet and greet that was outside of the department or walking into the department, just sort of doing like a drive by and just seeing people like walking around and talking and things like that. And so I think that's a fantastic um, way to really kind of get a, a sense of, you know, what real day to day shift life is like. So that's a really great point. All right. So we'll go. I think the order of hands I saw next will be Lexi, followed by Liza, and then back to Joel. Awesome, thank you. So one thing I wanted to add, everyone's kind of been talking about once you're on the interview and I wanted to take a step back and maybe talk about before um, in terms of where you're applying. I remember when I was in those shoes, I was like looking at all the different listservs and applying to places that had openings, but I might throw out there, right? Like apply anywhere, anywhere that you think you might wanna go, just because they don't necessarily have a spot listed doesn't mean they don't have a spot available. And I think sometimes in speaking for myself, maybe my imposter syndrome might hold me back from applying to these programs that felt like a reach for me. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to realize like just because it's not listed on their website that they're looking for faculty or looking for an, you know anybody to work with their group, whether it's a community or academic spot, um, I would just reach out to them anyway and don't let yourself hold you back um, as somebody who's been in those shoes. Yeah, that is so important. Um, I mean, I, I've certainly experienced that myself. And I think in some, you know, one, I think one of the only things that really motivated me to apply a job that I thought I wasn't qualified for was when the posting said, please apply, even if you might think you're not good enough for this job. Um, so I, I think that's like such an important take home point for, for, for really for anyone, but certainly if you are, you know, like a lot of us suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, Liza and Joel. Yeah, I was going to kind of um, reflect a couple of the points that were made earlier um, and kind of expand. I think um, that was an extremely good point is that uh, I think the sign of a good employer is that they recognize that you also are evaluating them. And it's maybe more so you evaluating them than the other way around by the time you get to an interview day. Um, we usually incorporate a bre both a breakfast and a lunch with people from the group for that exact reason so that they can see, kind of look around and say, do I feel comfortable? Are these the type of people I want to work with every day? And then um, also, I think uh, just generally, um, sometimes it can be difficult question to ask, but looking at the actual makeup of the group, how many women they have and all of that as well. Um, and the different age spans um, and those sorts of things can sometimes indicate issues. Um, I interviewed for jobs many, many years ago. And um, my first question at all of my jobs was at that time, because it was a big clue for me that there could be a problem or perhaps there wouldn't be was what is your maternity leave policy? Because um, most groups didn't have one at that time, but I still think it's unfortunately still in this day and age is still relevant as well. So I was just going to add on, you know, we live in kind of a virtual world and the chances are you're probably going to start off your interview process virtually. Um, sometimes with a phone call, but now that we have Zoom, it's probably going to be virtually. So, but just make sure, you know, as we talked about that observation period, I can't emphasize, I agree with LA, you know, it's very important that you spend some time there and not just like 10 minutes. I mean, I, most of my jobs, I try to go and spend several hours observing and, you know, and it's almost never offered unless you ask for it. Um, and the other thing, because you can see who your colleagues are, you know, what's the culture on sign out, you know, things like that. You can get a sense to what the flow of the idea is. And granted, everybody has bad days, right? So you have to give a little grain, grain of salt when it comes to it. The other thing I often will do, especially, you know, when I was a little bit more junior and, you know, it was kind of not sure 
what the rules are with scheduling and stuff, I'd ask for a copy of the last three month schedules. And then I would just pick somebody and be like, okay, this is Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith, I'm going to highlight and see what shifts Dr. Smith works. Assuming they're not a nocturnist or something like that. Cause you know, sometimes you get a sense to, you know, if a place is, you know, has, you know, special things or what have you. And so just wanting to have, you know, equitable treatment from the, from the beginning and that helped me to reflect. Great, thank you everyone so much for your responses. Um, I just wanted to offer up a few um, uh, pieces from the chat in case anyone watching this later um, can't see it. Um, from LA, uh, you know, talking about, you know, just calling the chair uh, as being the way that he got uh, his first job. Um, and then Cortland added 100% true, particularly with academics, they don't um, in general, list open spots and don't do much recruitment um, unless it's a leadership spot. Um, that's, that's certainly true. Um, and and Cortland also added with every single job that she applied for was a cold email to the chair. Um, and then LA also offered up spending at least an hour just getting a flavor of the ED to which you are applying, which makes perfect sense. And it, you know, to me, it seems like almost a mystery that it's not sort of standardly built into an interview process that you would spend that time, um, you know, visiting the place that you may spend a significant number of your hours in a day uh, working in and, you know, spending time with the folks there. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I think that kind of nicely flows into, you know, people have kind of started bringing up like questions that you should ask or pieces of information that you want to know um, before you go into an interview. So. Um, I guess just a, maybe just a broad uh, question to the panel, and I'll kind of combine a few that um, LA had, had put in his uh, preferred questions, which were, you know, how do you prepare for an interview? Like, say you've got a job, the, a potential employer that um, you feel really good about, it seems like the ideal job, what would you do to prepare in terms of, and, and also, I guess, along with that, how would you formulate your day or any questions that you would want to know before heading in there? Was that for me? Oh, yes, go ahead. Any Anyone. <laughs> I guess in terms of preparation, I uh, and, and I share this especially for for those applying in uh, in residency, but I think it, it, it definitely applies for uh, job markets, and I still do this even if I interview for uh, whatever positions I'm applying for. Um, I write down the top 10 things that I think is relevant to the job that I'm applying for that I have done. Uh, and really what this requires is being reflective um, and also having an updated CV because we're also so very busy, especially for residents. I can't imagine that they're like on top of like uh, updating their CV every year unless their APD kind of reminds them like, you really need to do this. Um, and so I think having that updated CV is helpful. Um, and for me, I think for the interview day, knowing that top 10, um, I personally would cover the top three things. So again, it's tiered, the top three, the top five, the top 10. Every single one I talk to will know about my top three things because it's a constant, like it's a, it's a narrative. It's the arc of what I'm trying to offer and I'm trying to convey to them. And so in many ways, I'm able to talk about it. So even if they don't ask me about something related to it, I will find a way to include that in the conversation because I want them to know that this is the one thing, the top three things I, they need to know about me. Great, thank you so much. Um, Cortland, I think you had your hand up. I was just gonna say, I literally do the exact same thing. Um, so I'll say, you know, I'm very passionate about this particular aspect of patient care. What has the department done in the past for this? And if nothing, you know, how would my role or how would I be supported if I joined faculty here? Um, so that kind of gets to what support they have also, which is a good way to kind of ask that question. Great, thank you. Um, Joel added, have you, or yeah, Joel added, have your elevator speech ready. I like that. Um, I, you know, I'm someone who, whether I am, you know, sending an email, talking to a group, giving a talk that's educational, whatever. I essentially have to script myself for things. I think that's how I tend to avoid using my crutch words, which I will do from time to time. It's okay, we can all give ourselves some grace, but I think making sure that I get those 
those those points across like you said like your top three your top whatever number um and yes hashtag self-compassion um just really <laughs> understanding that this is this is really also and i say this to a lot of um you know pre-meds who are going into medical school interviews right now that you know i think we might know at our, our level a little bit better than those who are just coming into the to the profession but just knowing that you're interviewing a, a potential employer just as much as they are interviewing you. And this is really your opportunity to show them what you have to offer. Um, but it's also your chance to see what they can do for you to help you thrive in your career. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, and then I did wanna just offer up one comment from the chat from Gus Garmel. Hello, Gus, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, in reference to the prior topic about observing in the ED with permission. Uh, perhaps at more than one time, uh, like when they tour you formally, so including things like days, evenings, weekends, um, and it will be perceived as interest and dedication will prove valuable to you as a candidate. So essentially, like kind of doing a little mini rotation in the department. Um, I think that's such a great uh, point and a, really an idea I think everyone should consider um, for that job you really, really want. Um, does anyone else have any uh, other thoughts to offer up with regard to this question, with regard to preparation, um, questions that you uh, would want to ask a potential employer? What questions do you recommend asking? Yes, Cortland. I was going to say, in addition to knowing what the department or institution has in terms of resources for your particular academic or community interest, um, I think it's important to know what resources they have for their patients. Because, you know, you don't want to go to a spot where unless you're, you know, single coverage out in the middle of nowhere, you want to make sure that you have resources to actually help your patients. So is there social work? Um, is there respiratory therapy? You know, even just as simple as what intubation supplies do they have? You know, are they going to have the resources to help you succeed as a physician, especially as a new grad? You want to be surrounded with the tools to help yourself succeed. So, you know. What medical supplies do they have? What social resources, like I said, social work? Is there a domestic violence team? You know, what happens if you have a concern for human trafficking for a patient? Are you going to be given the tools to help with that? Um, so in addition to, like I said, what resources for your particular interest, but also just departmental and institutional resources. And then another question that I asked, um, and it's a little bit tricky, but I asked, you know, how has the composition of the group changed and how if any way, do we expect it to change in the future? Because you basically want to know, like, why is the spot that you're applying for, why is it open? You know, did somebody leave because they weren't happy? But you're obviously not going to ask that. Um, but asking how is the composition of the group changed, it's kind of a way to get into that. So maybe they're hiring a bunch of new faces because um, there was some turnover. That could be a little bit of a red flag for you to look into further. You know, don't ask about that red flag on the interview, um, I would say. But, you know, ask about it after a little bit informally. Um, maybe they uh, were bought out by a different group. You know, that's something that you would wanna know. Maybe they're in some partnership talks with another group. That's also something you wanna know. And so a nice way to ask that is, how's the composition of the group changed and do we anticipate any changes in the future? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really resonating with, um, with your uh, piece about, you know, asking about the the sort of resources, whether clinical or non-clinical. I mean, and I think uh, Joel mentioned earlier, just, you know, we do come from sort of a biased environment where in a lot of residency programs, big academic centers, you tend to have it. I certainly did have, have just a lot of resources at your disposal. Like we had 24 hour case management and, you know, me as a fresh new grad, I almost like assumed that that was kind of a standard thing. And it's something that I've had to learn to just work without as someone who works all night shifts. And, you know, the idea of having to board someone to talk, you know, to get a case management consult or to have a social worker intervene to help folks with outpatient resources is, you know, can be really challenging. And, and that can, I think also just weigh on you a lot when you feel like, you know, you just don't have as much to offer your patients, um, whether it's procedural equipment, uh, you know, um, and, and other resources that are good for, for taking care of the whole patient. Um, LA, you had your hand up. I, I, I have a lot of questions here. I love asking questions uh, when, when I go into interviews because I really want to have uh, as, as best informed uh, decision as I can. So um, I'll read through them. Uh, so I asked like any anticipated changes 
Um, especially if you're applying for a group that is part of a CMG, a corporate management group, I made this mistake. I moved all the way from New York to California specifically for this county job that I love. Um, and I did not know that it was, I mean, I knew they was CMG. It didn't connect to me because I was a resident. Nobody really talks about that then, right? Um, and so questions like, how long do you have the contract? How often does the contract go off, go off for RFP? Because for me, three months into moving to California, my chair sent us an email like, hey, our contract is up for um, RFP. And so it doesn't look good. Here are the list of other emergency departments to apply for. Like it was very scary for a new grad to uh, go through that. And, and I can imagine now, especially with all the takeovers from one CMG to another and the mergers, that's even more of a realistic uh, concern. So ask those questions. Um, the next one that I have here are, what were the main reasons why people moved on to different jobs in the past three years? It's very finite. It doesn't, it, they can't be saying like, Things like, oh, it's family related if, if, if I'm focusing on the last three years, right? Because then it may apply to me, it may apply to like, so again, concerns about CMGs. Um, and then I ask those big, vague like uh, questions, like knowing what you know now, uh, what would you change um, about this program? That allows me to then align with the top 10 things that I have, because if it's something that I can offer, then I can also align myself in those, uh, in those things that they have. Um, what are characteristics of people who do very well in this department? Again, offers me the opportunity to highlight the top 10 things that I have in my list to also understand like, oh, I don't have research. Like, are there resources for people who are like me who don't do research? Uh, as uh, I think uh, Dr. Brown pointed out. Um, and I also like the questions like, what do you like the most about this department? Because it allows them to brag about their program. And also, I mean, like every single one that you ask that they lit up. And if they don't, then that's a red flag, right? Like they, they should be liking their, their, their program if they're interviewing you. Um, and lastly, um, again, I highlight uh, why I really love the job, if I really do love the job. Um, and then I ask, uh, if, if you were in my shoes, what questions should I be asking right now? Because then they're more, they're, it puts them in a mentorship role um, or even like a coaching role to kind of help me get to that job, uh, which then again, the dynamics kind of shifts a little bit. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, oh man, like things that I think I want to write down for, for my own future should the uh, opportunity arise. Um, I just want to offer up a few uh, points from the chat um, from Gus uh, to add to Cortland's excellent points about resources. Some smaller hospitals slash EDs don't admit peds or have OB or neurosurgery, for example, which is something you should know. It might influence your decision. I have absolutely been in that place working in a critical access hospital with essentially no specialty services and uh, the nearest labor and delivery being about you know 50 miles away and having to really make uh, snap decisions and, and be very confident in those two uh, when it comes to transferring patients to a higher level of care. Um, Joel followed up as well with, you know, asking again, what patients get transferred and are, are there agreements with other hospitals to accept them? That is so helpful to know so that when you're in that moment, um, you really don't have to try go looking for information, especially when it's the dead of the night. Um, and again, asking about people who left recently and why. Um, Cortland also had some other questions that she asked, which is, what is the strategic direction of the institution or department? Um, and what are the core values of the institution or department? Um, those are fantastic. Um, probably get a lot of really um, interesting responses to those. And I think also hearing from, you know, what, what people say and, and really what they d sort of see as a value. I mean, I think that could be very telling and, and making sure that that hopefully aligns with what yours are um, to really make sure that's a great fit. Um, and then from Joel, we have pay attention to what is not said as much as what is said. That's amazing. My experience uh, recruiters don't lie, but are or make uh, uh, experienced recruiters don't lie, but are selective in what they brag about naturally. That is very true. Um, so really kind of hitting at some of those other questions that folks raised about trying to figure out, you know, what might not be so apparent from the surface. Um, it, you know, why is this position open after the last person held it for a long time, or if it was something with, a, there's a lot of attrition, a lot of turnover, um, that's that's so important. Um, Liza is offering up, asking about APP uh, slash PA and NP supervision. Um, that is very important. It's becoming such a, a, a much more um, 
you know, a sort of prevalent role, I think, for a lot of us. I, I certainly have to provide supervision for our APPs um, and kind of seeing like what what that looks like. Are you someone working side by side and sort of on a consulting basis like I am signing charts, um, you know, and, and kind of what that looks like, what the composition of your department is when it comes to APPs. Um, and then LA said at one shop, I was expected to sign all the PA charts without seeing patients. Yep, that is um, absolutely something to know ahead of time. Um, I, I've certainly seen uh, charts from like residency friends and, or sort of like descriptions of charts from residency friends who talked about you know, just uh, unfortunate errors and things in the documentation that, you know, patient might have been discharged and that's uh, kind of against what they would have done if they had known about the patient. So really kind of assessing your comfort level um, and really what you think is is the right approach when when having to supervise other APPs. Um, and then from Cortland, um, same with mission, vision and goals. Um, they're going to sound good. So it's more important to focus on what is not said and what is not included. Um, I think it's great to look at, um, you know, websites and any other sort of materials that you're set ahead of time to kind of know what they have to say. Um, but you're right, what, what's really kind of beyond that? Um, or, or what do you mean by this specific value? How do you deliver on that? Um, and then from LA, it's okay to ask versions of the same questions to several people to get different perspectives. Um, that's certainly one that I've used many times. Um, and what common themes and quality, uh, common themes in quality review cases. So gives you an opportunity to chat about resources. Um, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, and then Lexi said, LA, if I'm ever looking for a new job, I'm reaching out to you for this list of questions, same. Um, and LA, again, I love interviews. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm really enjoying this discussion so far. Um, thank you everyone for those uh, comments. Oh, Joel, you had your hand raised. No, I was just gonna say, I, so I totally love the thing about asking the same questions in different ways to different people. That absolutely is incredibly helpful. The caveat to that is be very careful what that question is and try not to seem like you're completely fixated on something. Like if you ask them about like, you know, what do you do when you have a sick kid that you need to transfer? Um, then they're suddenly going to ask that to everybody. Everybody's going to debrief, be like, hey, they kept asking about taking care of children. They seem uncomfortable. You know, you don't want to have an assumption that that's not true. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Um, wow, this has been amazing so far. I'd like to just dive a little bit deeper. After all, we are the Jedi section. So we do want to also make sure that we focus on issues surrounding justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, Liza, you had a really incredible question that I'd like to um, that I'd like to use as we uh, as we dive in here, which is um, what types of things should a candidate look for when seeking a job to ascertain whether a group or company works to create and maintain a diverse workforce or workplace? Sorry, can you repeat that? I, I apologize. I'm... No worries. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so what types of things should a candidate look for when seeking a job to ascertain whether a group or company works to create and maintain a diverse workplace? I think, um, honestly, just asking that exact question, um, and it, I think it a direct question, but uh, I think as someone suggested, looking on uh, the group or company's website, um, look at the obvious, you know, obvious things like looking at the makeup of the, the group um, as well. But um, I think just asking that exact question is what, what it, you know, because you, you could still in this, uh, even in 2022, find a group that really wasn't or isn't very diverse, um, but perhaps they're trying. Um, and then I think, you know, candidates, it's difficult sometimes to be that first person who comes in who's uh, different. And then I think it goes back to that the support is, um, you know, what support do they have for, for new people coming in? Um, but if you're going to be the first, um, you know, uh, female physician in a group or the first um, underrepresented group minority, it's going to be, you're going to have a more difficult time. Um, so obviously a group that's at least trying to improve the, uh, their diversity, uh, is going to be, have a lot more support available for you. And also 
Uh, but I think just asking that precise question of the group is probably the best place to start. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. I, I can definitely remember there's one experience that sticks out in my mind of walking into a boardroom of, you know, about a dozen partners in a, in a, in a job interview and not seeing a single person who kind of looked like me or I felt might be able to relate in any way to, um, you know, to my background or my experiences. So, you know, and, and if that's something you want, that's, that's okay too. But I think, yeah, knowing, knowing what you're kind of knowing what you're getting into before you get into it. Um, and then I think one thing that's always, uh, one thing I've come to do over the, you know, sort of as I've kind of progressed throughout my own career is also looking at the makeup of the leadership, whether it's an academic center or you're looking at, um, you know, the C-suite of a hospital, the department chairs that you might be dealing with, like that can also be very telling too. And, and especially if you're someone who really wants to make sure that policies in your workplace are, are equitable because they really come from the top. Um, Cortland, you had your hand up and then LA. Thank you. I was just going to say, you know, it's important and diversity is obviously great. We want to be at a program that's very diverse um, with diverse opinions, people that look differently, people that look like us. Um, but it's also important to focus on inclusion. And so you can have a lot of diversity at a program or at an institution and there can be very limited inclusion. So it can still feel very homogeneous. It can feel as if you're not welcome. And so it's important to ask those questions about you know, if there's ever a conflict within the group, um, you know, how is that addressed? What are, and again, if the group doesn't have much diversity, you know, has it partnered with other institutions, has it partnered with other departments or local hospitals to see how they can work towards creating that diversity and inclusion? So basically, what are the steps that the hospital is taking? Um, and I actually think the question that Liza asked is a really good one to ask of everybody. Um, similar to what we were saying earlier, because I think that you'll get some different answers, um, which could be a red flag, um, or it could also just be different perspectives. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, you know, and I, I think just looking at, you know, my own workplace and, and hearing from others, you know, the especially over the last, you know, two, three years, um, a lot of places have, um, you know, made that sort of move to hire more more diverse uh, uh, candidates for for different positions, but it really, like Cortland said, it's it's not about just you know checking that box, but are those people actually sticking around? Are they being retained? Are they being you know treated equitably? Do they feel like they belong? Um, so that's that's so critical as well. Um, La. Yeah, I think along those lines, and and this may be because I come from a space of privilege that I feel comfortable asking this question, but I do think that perhaps. Um, I, for me, if I'm uncomfortable about something, I, I try to make that explicit because really it's it's a it's a curiosity thing from my end. So mentioning something like I see that I'll be the only X Y Z in this group, I really commend the efforts uh, towards uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, especially if there's like something written on their website. Um, I then I would ask the question of how have you navigated this before? Um, what does mentorship look like here? Uh, again, just getting into like specific things that. I may be assuming that they're interested in DEI, but maybe they're hiring me because of my work in quality review, or they're hiring me for X, Y, Z. Like, but for me, if if a particular identity of mine is very important, I think it's 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 good to ask those questions because then it allows them to also recognize that yeah, this is um, aligned with our mission, vision, values, and also you're right. Like we've never done this before. I anticipate that there's going to be some challenges. I will be your point person. Like. Having just that conversation, that is a very honest conversation. I want to work for that person as opposed to if they skirt away and they're uncomfortable, like that already is a red flag for me that oh, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge if especially uh, knowing that all of us are human beings, we're going to make mistakes. And so what happens when I make a mistake and I'm the only one who stands out here, I know from prior experiences that you're going to get like whether you want to or not, we're going to deal with that imposterism that somebody pointed out because it's part of transitions that gets heightened um, when you when you make mistakes. And so I want to be able to understand like what mentorship, what support system am I going to get, especially in those tougher uh, situations. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful point. I think um, 
think as someone uh, who made the transition into community practice a number of years ago, I, I didn't really think to even ask that question, um, thinking that was something that was more um, sort of structured within an academic, academic that's right. world, you know, and it's, it is so important, I think, especially um, I probably more so now than ever, um, you know, that, I mean, I love sitting in a, in a mentorship role. It's part of the reason why I do these, these um, sessions, but also I think, you know, I think no matter where you are in your career, it's so great to have your own mentorship and really just, um, you know, someone that uh, I think, I think having someone who can identify and relate to you is so critical. Um, I've had some great mentors in the past, but I, I know that the, the best ones I've had have, have really been able to kind of fill in that as well. Um, Liza, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, sometimes, uh, so when I uh, joined the group that I'm in now, um, I was one of only two um, female uh, physicians who were full-time and um, the, the only, <laughs> the only minority in the entire group, uh, if you can believe it. So, um, but I think that um, my involvement in recruiting has um, helped our group immensely in terms of, um, you know, having, attracting more female position. So I think you're right, looking at the makeup of the leadership, certainly, and also, um, you know, we've gone, we went from two physicians to now roughly 40% of the physicians in the group are female. So um, that's been, I think, helpful having someone, having a female actually doing the recruiting or having someone who's a minority do the recruiting. Um, but I also think it's important for once that new grad is in the group for a year or two, them sort of turning around. And then what I like to do is, is then invite those same people to now come and help recruit other physicians, young physicians or new grads. Um, so I think it kind of um, self perpetuates or uh, has that opportunity to sort of improve itself as you go along as well. I, I love that. <laughs> I mean, and I'm just thinking, you know, for anyone who's watching either now or later, I mean, if, if you haven't seen the statistic, I mean, in the US, uh, women physicians in emergency medicine probably make up less, it's typically less than 30% of the workforce, um, about 26 to 27% is what I typically see in, in survey data. Um, so, you know, for a group to go from like two and, and very little diversity when it comes to sort of race and ethnicity to, to really improve in that way is so incredible. Um, but I think Liza brings up a really good point that it's about um, making sure that those people who are from groups that are sort of marginalized, minoritized, um, having them kind of be in that role or, or contribute to that role of bringing in the next uh, the next person to the group, I think, because you do, you know, when you have a social identity that is is uh, you know whether it's a uh, marginalized, minoritized, um, you just you look through a different lens, and you do want to bring in people who look like you, who identify with you. Um, but also, you know, just knowing that there are just different lived experiences that people go through based on who they are. And so I think that's so critical in, in terms of bringing um, folks into leadership spaces. Um, just a couple things from the chat from Gus. Uh, everyone benefits from good mentors. Got to seek them out. I mean, nobody. So, so Gus was one of my residency directors. And I think that, uh, you know, not surprising at all to see that comment. I think he was probably one of the most... Uh, incredible mentors I had certainly through residency and even now eight years out still checking in with me all the time and always offering helpful advice. Um, LA said the better leaders will then follow up with you or connect you with a similar or another person who shared a similar experience so you can feel comfortable asking those questions that's great it's a great way to measure uh, psychological safety that is that is Yes, so true. Um, and then Cortland said the makeup of leadership, but also for academic groups, uh, the makeup of individuals at each academic rank. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, so I think that, that kind of um, provides a nice segue as we get towards the end here about, you know, we, we're talking about diversity, but really like equity and inclusion um, really are, I think, are the ones that need to be um, kind of at the, at the really at the forefront of, of making sure that you'll be happy in a job and sort of be able to stay in that role. So, you know, a few folks, um, I think Lexi brought up 
something Joel brought up something um, as well. But you know, how do you? Or what kind of questions would you ask, or how would you really um, sort of assess whether a potential employer is going to be inclusive? Whether you are a person of color um, based on your gender, based on whether you are a queer person, like any sort of identity that you have, you want to make sure that as a member of that community that you are going to be taken care of what what kind of things would you would you advise to people looking for a job uh, looking through that lens of their identity yes Joel well tack on what Elliot said I mean I, I think some of my better interview experience has definitely been when someone you know, knows that I identify as someone who's a gay man. And so they'll have me have the opportunity to speak to somebody because there are some questions about comfort that, you know, quite frankly, is hard. And, you know, being gay is a little bit more, I guess it's not more or less, but it's, it's just different in the sense that, you know, I can probably pass as a straight white guy with a bunch of privilege that goes along with that. Um, having said that, you know, certainly that's not my identity necessarily. And so it's one of those things where, you know, having that opportunity and, you know, visual cues, like, you know, often if there's signs and of diversity in a diverse group and a group's faculty, diverse values, that hopefully means that they are in all respects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but what ultimately that gets to is belonging, right? I mean, you want to make sure that you're in a situation where you feel like you can belong with a group. And if you don't feel like you're going to belong, you're not going to feel like you can thrive and be successful and like it's a potentially long-term thing. And so I think it's really important, you know, sometimes even simple things, like I definitely appreciate everyone putting their pronouns, for example, on there. And that, you know, may not apply to me necessarily, but it's another sign of acceptance and inclusion and belonging. So I think little things like that can go much longer, further away than probably we anticipate. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, let's see, LA, you had your hand up and then Cortland as well. I think Liza has her uh, hand up first. Sorry, I didn't, yeah, go I, I didn't put my hand down from earlier. <laughs> Okay, no problem. <laughs> Got it. Um, so for me, I think uh, to to piggyback what uh, Joel added, I think that um, kind of circling back to what we talked about earlier, if you get the opportunity to chat with somebody else who works there that is not part of leadership, um, or during that orientation, or not orientation, the, the interview, and then you just ask like, hey, uh, is it okay if I just like hang out in the ED as I'm waiting for my Uber ride? Like, Things like that is usually how I, well, it was not Uber before, it was like taxi, like that's that was my excuse to uh, hang out in the ED uh, when I was interviewing. Uh, but then asking those faculty, like, hey, what are some examples where you saw your chair having your back? Because I think it highlights to their values, like what, like, what are the things that they're actually willing to like stand up for you? Um, and also it, it gets to vulnerability. Um, if, if you can get somebody and and I think there's a good a good way of understanding um, this concept of these are going to be my people. Um, if you ask me that, I have like a ton of things to say, right? Because then you, I know that you'll feel like I, you can trust me that I can actually share with you like real cases as opposed to if I ask the chair that it's kind of hard because they're going to toot their own horn and then they're not, they also have to like protect people's um, identities and, and privacy, but asking like regular day-to-day -day people um, you'll get those answers, I think, a lot clearer and uh, with uh, a better, um, for me, uh, return of investment for, for being uh, brave to ask those. Thank you so much. Um, Cortland. Thank you. I think another way to get a sense of the culture of the department, hospital, or institution that you're at is looking at what initiatives and programs they have. So for their colleagues, for their residents, for their patients even. Um, so, you know, everything going on with the Supreme Court currently as a woman, you know, I take that very close to the heart. And so I'm really fortunate where I'm at a program where we're having active talks about that. You know, we are passing out condoms. We're offering birth control in the emergency department. And so that tells you a little bit about that's the culture of this program. Um, if you ask about that and somebody doesn't mention anything that the department institution is doing, you know, then that might be a little bit of a red flag. It might also be that it's just a smaller, um, smaller department or smaller emergency group. Um, 
but that's just one way to kind of get a sense of what some of the values are, because something a program's not going to get approved, it's not going to get pushed through if most of the faculty or most of the individuals that are working there don't agree with it. Yeah, that's a really fantastic point. Um, really assessing the culture, which I th I think that's a that's a great approach to take, especially kind of you know, given like any current social events that are going on, things that are certainly um, tied either directly or indirectly to healthcare, um, especially for more marginalized groups. Um, and so I know I know sometimes that can be difficult to really see like what is the culture of this place like before you actually start working. But but yeah, I think asking very specific questions about um, you know how a, how a group is is responding, and I, I think that no matter what state you live in, I think that's a great question to ask because it, it, it almost gives you a sense of um, this is how this group is kind of responding to the moment that we're in right now, that we're not just because we enter the building of the hospital, we're not completely walled off from, you know, what's going on outside the four walls of the hospital. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really important point to bring up and, and I think also very, uh, uh, very pertinent to the, to the medical care that you'll be providing to patients. Um, so thank you everyone so much. Well, I think, um, first of all, uh, does anyone have any other um, thoughts they want to share? I know LA had put a link to a book in the chat, um, which is called The New Rules Playbook, written by two amazing women. Um, and then Joel offered, you know, everyone wants to feel and, and needs to be supported. And that is so true, like regardless of who you are. Um, and LA is double downing on Joel's point as a final takeaway. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then Gus says, yes, change is hard. Don't necessarily shy away from a position which doesn't have the exact culture you desire. Um, consider being a change agent, not easy, but can be extremely rewarding. Um, I can definitely relate to that, um, you know, as someone who's trying to start some, some DEI work in my own institution from, from having essentially no uh, programming before, no task force or committee, and um, taking a lot of pride in that, but knowing that there are going to be obstacles um, along the way and difficult conversations with that. So it is um, wonderful to be in that position of being sort of a, a change maker, but also uh, I think even just, uh, you know, uh, coming off of what Joel and, and LA said, just making sure that you are supported because you really can't do that work if you don't have uh, a team uh, of people with you to really help you through it. Um, LA, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier self-compassion and, and, and I think that it's important to understand this in the context of I know that this is going to be challenging. You're going to be making uh, a decision that may, to you, may feel like it's going to be forever, but it's just a job. It's just one job. It doesn't mean you have to stay there forever, right? But at least you're getting yourself out there exploring different options. And the more you do that, the more you're going to find out what actually works better for you, uh, rather than where you're at now, at the comfort of your residency program uh, and, and all the support systems they have. So again, like, just remember to just be a little kinder to yourself as you navigate this, because this is not easy. Everybody goes through this and this transition is just temporary. You're gonna be an amazing emergency physician by virtue of the fact that you spent a lot of time training to be an emergency physician. And somewhere out there, you're gonna find that nice place. And if not, you can change. Yes, absolutely. I think it, um... I think I've worked in maybe like 10 different hospitals in my eight year career so far. So I mean, yes, just know. And that's, you know, we're emergency physicians. This is part of what we are trained to do. I mean, we're, we respond to change very well in our clinical environments, but you can also, you know, mod make, make modifications to your career and really find that job that hopefully will be the one that you stay at for the remainder of your career. And if it's not, you can always uh, switch and change, you know, change. I mean, I've certainly found that that is, is always a possibility, or at least it, it has been for me. I know there was some um, some issues with finding jobs like in the last uh, couple of years with COVID, but um, you know, yes, we can choose to stay or go anywhere. Um, hashtag anywhere, anyone, anytime, perfect. Yeah, that it's, I mean, it's just, it's it's one of our values in the emergency department. Um, well, I love, I love that, um, that point about self-compassion too. I think that's so critical. Um, and I think that's a great uh, sort of segue into our last portion of our session. Um, if any of our panelists have any additional take-home points they wanna offer to our, uh, to our group here, uh, please feel free to just um, unmute yourself and um, go ahead and um, just give us those points. 
I'll go ahead. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about um, being two years out of residency is negotiating in a contract um, and kind of what can you negotiate, what can't you. And so this is a little bit more tangible. So if you're going into academics, you can obviously negotiate a lot less. Um, but there are some things. So you can negotiate your start date, your CME funds, relocation funds, FTE, which stands for full time equivalent. So I am not full time, even though I am faculty. And that's because I wanted to work a few shifts PRN in the community just because I was straight out of residency. I wanted to make sure that I didn't, you know, lose all of my procedural skills. Um, you can also negotiate your title. Um, titles don't necessarily come with any buy down. It's pretty hard to negotiate buy down in academics and buy down is um, basically what you will get paid for, but you're not on a clinical shift. And so you're doing your other professional activities, um, but it's pretty easy for an institution to make up a random title for you um, if it doesn't come with any other, you know, perks, but it can actually be very beneficial to you, especially as a new grad, because if you're emailing somebody else from that hospital and they see this title, um, you know, it gives you a little bit more credit. Um, and then if you're going into the community, you can negotiate a lot more. Basically everything I said above, you can negotiate salary, vacation, scheduling specifics. You know, if you wanna have the last week off of each month, that's something that you could potentially mention, bonuses, including signing bonuses. And so just be pretty aggressive whenever you're bringing up these negotiation contracts. You know, worst case, you will, get shut down, but I think it's pretty rare for a place that really wants you to take away an offer just because you asked for something that matters to you. Worst case, they'll just say no. I was, I was gonna say that um, I think it depends on this. I completely agree with um, what you just said. It de does depend on the situation. So for example, everybody gets the same contract in our group, we're obviously not academic and um, but we have negotiated uh, just as you described titles and then sometimes even stipends associated with the titles depending on people's background or expertise in a specific area or fellowship training. Um, but uh, that was actually one of the questions I think I had listed for discussion points was finding out does everybody get the same contract which is how our group does it or um, if everyone's getting different contracts, then you're right. Uh, absolutely, every every benefit and the pay is uh, completely negotiable. And then, unfortunately, it is dependent on how hard you negotiate for or advocate for yourself. You're yeah, thank you a, so much. If you're applying for a, a job uh, that is under a CMG. Um, take a moment to look at the contract specifically about due process. We wrote about this um, a few years ago. It is sometimes you're going to be very shocked. They like they literally put in multiple lines that you have no due process. And, 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 and if you can't cross that out, then just be careful, right? Like there are many other jobs out there for you to compromise your, your, your all the work that you've done uh, because it's, it affects your reputation. It affects your uh, your your well being like so just be careful about the due process part. And I'd like to reiterate kind of something that's come up as a theme across multiple different topics today, um, which is that you're interviewing them right like yes they're interviewing you but don't forget that you're interviewing them and it's okay to ask hard questions. And it's okay to push in areas that are important to you. Um, this isn't just a one way street. And I feel like growing up, if you will, in the medical education system, we're kind of structured to just go to the next place, right? Next place, next place. And now finally, like you have a little bit of say in where you're going. So I want you to like take that and be empowered and really bring that empowerment to each of the interviews that you go on each of the departments that you're looking at. Yes, I love that. It's, it, that's, that's absolutely so true. Like knowing really that, um, you know, regardless of where you are in your career, like, you know, I think I think as emergency physicians, we are we're we're marketable. I mean, we each have something unique to offer a job, and I think that really, like like Lexi said, having that empowerment really shine through um, 
it really can only help you um, if, if for no other reason to just be kind to yourself and just, you know, be proud of yourself for, for how far you've come, um, even if this is your first job straight out of residency. Um, and I, you know, I think we could probably do an entire other hour on contract negotiation. So maybe I will like put that as a topic for a future uh, panel. But I do want to just say um, thank you so much to all of our panelists for your contributions, for sharing your expertise and reflecting on your experiences with us. Um, I think this has been so impactful. Um, the um, I'm going to put the link to our Jedi website in the chat there, and that's where you, uh, for any audience members, that's where you can go and register for any future sessions, um, see the recordings for sessions like tonight's, and then um, any other upcoming Jedi events are, are viewable there. So please check that out. Um, please plan to join us for our next Jedi mentorship session, which will likely be happening in November. Details uh, to be determined. Um, so we will keep you informed about that. Um, thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. And this concludes our program tonight. Thank you. Thank you.